A date which will live in infamy. Both of those projects, initiatives, got off the ground because of the Gare River. The 11 Olympic team members slain in West Germany. The Olympic Games. So geheit war der Brüder in Amerika. So kalt und schabes at the Skitzer. Out of the 24 who were killed were Americans who had come to learn in heaven. I say one million Jewish children who were made to be cut and who shot. Whoever heard such beautiful words, It is never too little. It is never too late, and it is never enough. Jewish History Soundbites, bringing alive the world of our glorious past. Here is our host, live from Jerusalem, Jewish historian and tour guide. Welcome, everyone, to Yehuda Jewish History Gabbard. Soundbites. This is Yehuda Geber with another episode of Jewish History Soundbites, and this episode has been generously sponsored by the Friedman family in honor of the wonderful Baruch Tzvi, with much continued Hatzlacha in your Avedah Sakaydesh, and thank you. Um, so the the um, before we get to this part one of uh, uh, the story of Mayor Kahana, I want to just um, cl- clarification or two about uh, from a previous episode on the Jewish community of Rhodes. I got some nice feedback. I, in the beginning, I made a uh, an assertion about uh, Greek and Latin, and then I went off on a tangent about French and English. I learned a big lesson from that, because since I was in, I subsequently found out from our knowledgeable listeners that I was incorrect in my assertions, that it's not wise to try to show off that I know about pre-modern Jewish history. It's just a bad idea. Stick to things I know. And the Roman Empire is something I definitely do not. So I got this uh, feedback from a listener. I just heard you say, and I didn't even get into the episode, that Greek was the court language of the Roman Empire. I'm not a historian, didn't even Google this, but I'm like 99% sure that the Western Empire spoke Latin, the Eastern Empire spoke Greek, both as the court language and the common language within the respective capitals. The provinces spoke their local languages. So I then went ahead and actually looked it up instead of speaking off the cuff like I did on the episode. And it turns out that uh, it's more or less correct. So Greek was a very much spoken language in the Roman Empire, but only in certain parts. And um, and both as a common language and among the aristocracy. And then, to, to make it even worse, the point I made about French and English wasn't exactly correct either. And this is another letter I got from another listener. First off, your point about French and English is slightly more complicated than the way it was presented. It was not so much that the lower class spoke English and the upper class spoke French. Rather, the lower class spoke Anglo-Saxon. What we call English today is really the product of Anglo-Saxon and French. The reason for so many duplicate words in English stems from this melding. For example, beef in French and meat in Anglo-Saxon. Even now, that higher and lower class distinction remains as in that example. All right, so lesson learned, and I'll stick to modern history from now on. Uh, also, just there was a misspeak. I mentioned the, the term Shadar in the Rhodes episode, and I misspoke and said Shlucha de Rachmana, and it is obviously Shlucha de Rabbanan, a mes- emissary of the rabbis, not emissary of the Torah. Um now, before we get into Mayor Kahana again, there's oh, it's just too exciting. There's Jewish history and current events and a lot going on. So I just wanted to point out a couple of it. First of all, Jewish history has been made in the United States with uh, Chuck Schumer, a senator from New York, becoming the highest Jewish elected official ever in the history of the country just to remind you that Supreme Court justices as well as cabinet appointments are not elected officials. So to become the Senate majority leader, 
was uh, is an achievement made by a Jew, the highest office ever made by a Jew. The Soviet Union had higher, had higher Jews. I don't know if they're elected either. Uh, Kamenev and Trotsky and Kaganovich and others were um, were uh, pretty got pretty high in the Soviet Union. And then, of course, you had in Europe, you had in Rosa Luxemburg, who almost made it in Germany right after World War One, and then Leon Blum in France was a socialist uh, prime minister in the 1930s. But in the U.S., the United States, this is history. So I have a Jew from Brooklyn whose grandparents immigrated from Chartkiv in, in the Ukraine. That's, that's where Schumer, Schumer's families come from, so become the Senate Majority Leader. He, he, it's funny, the way he rose up is that he succeeded first at the State Assembly, he succeeded Stephen Solars, who was another Jew from New York. Then in the Congress, he succeeded Elizabeth Holtzman, who was another Jew from New York. And she succeeded another Jew from New York in the Senate named Jacob Javits. So, you know, politics in New York is, uh, is very Jewish. And recent historic deaths. Larry King died yesterday. Larry King was born Larry Zeiger, was born in Brownsville. And his, his Brooklyn accent was so distinctive. So, uh, um, his signature. Um, immigrant parents in the garment industry, like everyone else. His mother was from Lita, from Lithuania, and his father was from Ukraine. And he starts out in radio in Florida, and the rest is history. And what's even more incredible about Larry King is that he was a Jew from Brooklyn, and he became well-known as an interviewer for being a listener and not interrupting, not interrupting. So it makes you wonder if he was actually a Jew from Brooklyn or not. Um also, you know that on Jewish history sound bites, I consider baseball history part of Jewish history, just because baseball is, you know, is something I like. So Hank Aaron, uh, Hammer and Hank, one of the greatest baseball players ever, also uh, just uh, died yesterday or two days ago. And there is actually a Jewish connection. Um, he, when uh, the Braves moved from uh, Milwaukee to Atlanta in 1966, so they were the first baseball team to move to the South. And in the 1960s was the civil rights movement, the desegregation of the South was a very tense time. And how would baseball be able to flourish there? How would African-American players be comfortable in Atlanta? Where would they sleep? Hotels were still segregated. Restaurants were still segregated. Where would they eat with, with dignity? So especially since the Braves star at the time was Hank Aaron. So there were two Jewish brothers, actually, Irving and Marvin Goldstein, who were dentists or dentists and orthodontists, and they were children of immigrants from Russia who had fled anti-Semitism. And they opened the first integrated dental clinic in Atlanta that, uh, that uh, you know, catered to all, all ethnicities and colors, and uh, which was a novelty in Atlanta at the time, believe it or not. And during the war, they were in the United States military, where... At least one of them helped uh, with Holocaust survivors who survived the concentration camp camps. Um, after the war, they bought Atlanta real estate and they opened the first nice hotel with restaurants that was open to all clients and non-segregated, which was revolutionary at the time. The Ku Klux Klan demonstrated in front of the hotel. Um, but that enabled the Braves to move to Atlanta because that hotel was available. That's what closed the deal. That's what... Uh, they enabled them to move from Milwaukee to Atlanta. So the Jews had a, a role in, in, in Hank Aaron arriving in Atlanta. Now we go to um, Mayor Kahana, one of the most interesting characters in recent post-war Jewish history. And it's quite a challenge to speak about him. Definitely going to be more than one part of this series because it's just too too complex and and, and, and uh much of a story to cram into one part. So sponsorships uh, are available for parts two, possibly three, and of course for other episodes as well. So be in touch with me about that. Um, I'm not going to get to his being in Israel, the Israel stage in part one. We're only going to be focused on the United States. We might not even finish that either. Uh, it's 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 a challenging topic because anything that's so recent, and he you know he's assassinated in 1990, so it's really recent history. So there's a lot of people around there who knew him. Um, people get emotional, and it's a, a tense topic. It's political. It's a controversial. He was a multifaceted individual who was outspoken, very controversial. 
Um, it's hard to do justice to, to the topic, to him. So I don't want to ruffle any feathers or offend anyone. So I don't want to take any political stances. I want to apologize in advance if anything comes out that way. Uh, many don't agree with his views or actions, but he is a piece of history, a piece of Jewish history, and a human story as well. Very complex uh, characters on the periphery, uh, outside of the mainstream of Jewish life. Um, yet by all accounts, he was brilliant and charismatic and passionate and very provocative. Uh, you know, he, he, he was consciously provocative. It was not a lack of tact, but it was conscious to shake people out of their comfort zone and, and uh, one of the titles of his books uh, says it all, Uncomfortable Questions for Comfortable Jews. In other words, he's, he's out there to, create, to stir the pot, to, to, to create controversy, to shake them out of the materialism and the superficiality of, of the path towards intermarriage and assimilation. He had a lot of criticism of American Jewry. He loved publicity. He saw publicity as a valuable tool, but even more so, he loved other Jews. He loved the Jew, Jewish people, and he pursued truth without compromise, and that's what made him... Um, in many ways, is such an extremist. Eventually, of course, he becomes a martyr as well, which complicates the story even more. Um, he was anti-passivity as a result of the Holocaust. The Holocaust, of course, played a major role in his shaping his worldview, which we'll get to. Uh, it was always the metaphor for everything he did. Uh, he was very critical, very critical of basically everyone, but very funny also. He was critical in a very funny way, he was humorous. No one in recent Jewish history got involved in the amount of issues that he did with such a love of the Jewish people that he had while being so controversial at the same time. So there's, there's really, it's really what I'm trying to say is the nuance and the complication here is, is make, to make it uh, quite a task to be able to uh, cover the story in a uh, dispassionate way. There's another point. Um, there's the human side of the story. He was quite a tragic figure. Whether one agreed with him or not, he... He was lonely. He was quite alone in most of the things he did. He was faced a lot of opposition in the United States, later on in Israel, in the Knesset. Everyone, most almost the entire Knesset would boycott, just simply walk out when he got up to speak. And, you know, because of his views. And just imagine, just but just think about the human being for a second. Just think about what that must feel like. Every time you get up to speak, everyone walks out. Um, and uh, I know how, how I would feel if, if no one listened to an episode of mine, right? So it's the same. That's a, it's it's much greater if you're in the Knesset speaking and everyone just walks out in front of your face. Um, so the the there's there's the Kahana, the person, and his biography and his life story and the, his world that he lived in, and then there's Kahana as a set of ideas, as a movement, as an ideology that he spawned both his supporters and his detractors. There's really two different stories, which obviously overlap at every stage. But uh, it's two different stories. There's Kahana the person, and there's Kahana the, the ideology. Uh, finally, there's also the desire to see things historically, in their own context, in real time, as much as it's possible. That's the desire in any topic that we cover. Though with the Kahana story, there are two occurrences which cast a retroactive shadow and make it nearly impossible to separate them from the story as it happened in real time, because the way we look at it today, the way we view it in hindsight today, is through the prism of these two Events. Number one, the fact that he was assassinated. So he gets killed, Al Kiddush Hashem, by a terrorist. He becomes a martyr, and that definitely changes the story. It, it colors our view. Number two, on the opposite side of the spectrum, you have many stories, but perhaps most notably the Baruch Goldstein story in the Maris Machpela in, in 1994, which there's straight up uh, Jewish terrorism, uh, murdering uh, Muslim worshippers in a mosque. A terrible, terrible, tragic story of uh, Jewish terrorism. And Kahana's name and ideology and movement became attached to the Baruch Goldstein story, whether it's justified or not. And, and that's not what I'm coming to judge or not. And whether he would have opposed such an act or not. But it became it became attached to it. So the, that colors the whole story retroactively as well. And, it, and therefore it makes uh, things uh, also more challenging. On the other hand... There's loads of sources out there on Kahana. Tons. It's just en endless, almost. Loads written about him and spoken about him, and speeches and books and biographies. He was a very public figure. He used to have all these college debates and campuses, lectures that he gave, many appearances on TV, radio talk shows. There was lots of interest in him while he was alive. Articles about him, lectures, his videos of his own lectures available online, many books that he authored. He was a prolific writer, letters and 
articles. He was authored a tremendous amount, uh, not only in books, but perhaps even more so in thousands of articles in various publications, predominantly the Jewish press, but in many other uh, newspapers as well, under several pseudonyms, including articles about, uh, surprisingly, New York sports. Uh, he was a sports writer. He was a Yankee fan, which was quite unique for someone who grew up in Brooklyn at that time. The 1930s and 40s, almost all working-class Brooklyn Jewish families were Dodgers fans, and he was a Yankee fan, so he was an iconoclast even in his uh, sports that he uh, uh, that he was a fan of. Um, so it was not exclusively Jewish activism topics. He wrote Sfarim uh, as well. He was something of a Talmud Chacham, and he authored uh, a scholarly Sfarim. He was a very public figure. There's also... What I gained uh, in preparation for this was a speech of Rabbi uh, Przansky and Yu Torah, fantastic, contained a lot of information. But I want to give a special thank you to the incomparable Menachem Butler for a lecture he gave just recently together with Zev Elif about Kahana and his legacy, which is available online. I got a lot of information from it, tidbits, stories. So I want to give a big thank you to them as well. Uh, the first time I heard of Kahana was in a book I read as a child. It was one of the first and one of my favorite, actually, till today, after I graduated from the Bernstein Bears and Curious George, which I haven't really graduated from because I still enjoy when I read it to my kids. But once I started reading a little more advanced, little child, I read a book called Skull Caps and Switchblades. It was by a fellow by the name of David Lazerson. He was a Lubavitcher chassid living in Buffalo who taught in the Buffalo school system in the inner city. Uh, it's a fascinating book. Uh, experiences really, really amazing. Either way, he mentioned Kahana, and it was the first time I had ever heard of Kahana. And what makes it interesting is that the book was published in 1987. So when Kahana was still alive, and he and he was still in the Knesset, and he discusses a, a Chabad friend of his who was uh, the who, the founder who started the JDL chapter in Buffalo. And then he goes on to describe his encounter with Kahana. So I'm going to read straight from the book. Um, it's just, it's just to give you a feeling of how it was my first exposure to Kahana. and really gives a, a nice picture. Um, while I disagreed with many of the violent methods of the JDL, I was immensely pleased that there was a growing number of young, proud Jews, even in Buffalo, New York. Every couple of years, Rabbi Mayor Kahana, former head of National JDL and current Knesset member in Israel, came to Buffalo to speak. His speeches were always controversial and often were frequented, frequented by hecklers of all persuasions, including university students and Arabs. It was not only a learning experience, but quite entertaining, as Kahana made minced meat of his opposition. He usually did it with a clear, with clear level-headed answers, quite in contrast to the people yelling emotionally at him. Since Big Mo was instrumental in bringing Kahana to Buffalo, the rabbi or some of his crew from New York City would spend the night at my house. It was both an exciting and eye-opening experience to host the rabbi. Unlike his reputation in the media, he was very warm and personable. He paid special attention to our children, playing with them in a cute fatherly way. Of course, he spoke to us about Israel. Kahana believes that Jews should make Aliyah and move to our homeland. I told the rabbi my reasons for staying in America, which he understood. Still, he maintained that we belonged in Israel. We spoke until it was close to 1.30 in the morning. He finally excused himself. I must go to bed, he said. I have to be up at 5 a.m. Why so early, rabbi, I asked. Our kids won't start making noise until about 7 a.m. I once read in a magazine, he explained, that one of the Arab sheikhs gets up at 5.30 in the morning to study the Quran. I thought to myself that if he can do that for the Quran, surely I can do better for our Torah. I simply shook my head in admiration. I had enough of a problem getting out of the sack at 7.30 a.m. to face my students. So that's, uh, you know, in, in a way it brings out a lot of the facets of the Quran, or just a couple of paragraphs. Um, but if we start from the beginning of the story, his childhood and family background, the Jewish world of Brooklyn that he grew up in, his father was Rabbi Charles Yecheskel uh, uh, Kahana, who was a rabbi, um, and uh, he came from Tzfas originally, from a prominent uh, Kahana, the Kahana family in, in, in Tzfas, a very prominent rabbinic family. Um, he himself, Mayor Kahana, was named for Mayor Simcha of Dvinsk. His mother's family originally came from Dvinsk, and uh, his great uncle actually was one of the rare people to have received smicha from Dar Sameach, and uh, so he got the name, the mayor. Uh, so the the um, he has a brother actually. Mayor Kahana has a brother who's still around, still alive. Reb Nachman Kahana, who's a rabbi in living in Israel, he's the author of of uh, some acclaimed sfarim. So the family is a 
is a you know prominent rabbinic family till today. And he grows up with a Zionist background as a youth, revisionist Zionism. His father knew Jabotinsky and and uh, um, Peter Bergson, who was in America at the time during the war. Later on, um, he he though he grows up with the Jabotinskyist uh, revisionist Zionist background. Later on, he joins religious Zionism, and he becomes a leader in Bnei Akiva, in New York City. In fact, Rabbi Rakefet was in a was in his Bnei Akiva group and knew him growing up in Bnei Akiva. He was the Mayor Khan was the head of the regional head or whatever it was of the local Bnei Akiva. He went to Yeshiva Flatbush, um, Brooklyn Talmudic Academy, and then to Mir Brooklyn. And it was in Mir Brooklyn that he changed his name from Martin to Mayor. And he becomes a very influenced, becomes a close Talmud of Rabbi Ram Kalmanovich, the Rosh Yeshiva of Mir Brooklyn at the time. And he's the one who galvanizes him to activism on behalf of the Jewish people. Of course, Rabbi Ram Kalmanovich, who I discussed in a couple of episodes, um, was a tremendous activist on behalf of the Jewish people in many ways. And uh, and he inspires the young Mayor Kahana, eventually Mayor Kahana, because, who delves into learning in Mir Brooklyn, eventually gets smicha. And Rabbi Ram Kalmanovich was actually his Masader Kedushin at his wedding. And my uh, friend Yisrael Besser's recent excellent book about uh, Rabbi David Schrank. So there's a, a great story that uh, Rabbi David Schrank knew him in Mir Brooklyn. So after Mayor Kahana's assassination, so everyone was gossiping about it, the assassination, about him in, in, in Rabbi David Schrank's yeshiva. So he said, if you want to hear a story about Mayor Kahana, let me tell you a story. He said that he sustained, uh, he grew up in, in, in somewhat in poverty and financial challenges. When he grew up, so he had a paper route to, to support himself. And he was up at the wee hours of the morning to deliver papers. And when he would arrive at First Seder in Mir Brooklyn, he was exhausted. And yet he applied himself completely to his studies, full of energy, completely devoted to his learning. And if you want to talk about Mayor Kahana, then that's a story about Mayor Kahana, about how he devoted himself to his learning, despite the fact of his financial challenges and that he was up so early in the morning delivering papers. It's a, it's a nice, again, another fresh uh, perspective. He goes on to school. He gets a few degrees in political science, law. He gets a master's in international relations from NYU. So here we have, right at the uh, cusp of his activism, you have an interesting combination. You have Brooklyn plus the immigrant Orthodox Jewish family background, plus Zionism, both revisionist Zionism and religious Zionism, plus a strong yeshiva education, plus his college degrees. And from that, he embarks on a career of activism. So his early activism, right away, he he understands the potential of the college student community. He's one of the first to see that potential. Um, He looks around at New York Jewish life, New York City general life, how demographics are changing in New York City neighborhoods. He has a clear vision of what's going to happen to the city, of rising crime rates, and um, his actual activism started even earlier. That's the truth. As a teenager, he was at a protest against the British Foreign Secretary Ernst Bevan to protest his not allowing Jewish immigration to Palestine. He threw things at him and was arrested for the first of many times due to go on to be arrested in the United States and in Israel many times throughout his life. But that was his first one when he was a young teenager. But uh, along with his activism, he also embarks on a rabbinical career. He becomes the rabbi in the Howard Beach neighborhood in Queens, and he shifts the synagogue from conservative to, uh, conservative, excuse me, to orthodox. Um, and also, again, here, his focus is on educating the youth as an educator, as someone to inspire uh, towards Jewish observance, uh, the congregation was not that excited about his inspiring the youth towards Kashrus and Shabbos and things like that. So they released him at the after you know they released his contract after a couple of years. But uh, that experience in the American rabbinate shaped his outlook on the future of uh, the American Jewish community, and would be a theme that he would return to over the ensuing uh, decades. He became quite disillusioned with the establishment uh, organizational life in America, and he became quite anti-establishment, which would become a, a feature of his, a dominant feature of his activism. So, 
He's involved in all kinds of other activities at this time, anti-communist activities. He's very anti-communist. In fact, um, he said himself in an interview, it's, it's never been actually verified, but this is what he claimed in an interview, that um, that he was tapped by the FBI to infiltrate the far-right John Birch Society um, because of his because of anti-communism to report on his findings uh, and he goes on to found uh, the July 4th movement which was an anti-communist organization he goes on to uh, stir up support for the Vietnam War um, which which was which was uh, which happened to be connected to his understanding of support for Israel in, a, in an interesting way but also because of his anti-communist Stance and anti the Soviet Union stance. Um, he also, which, which you think about that, to go on college campuses in the late 1960s and be pro the Vietnam War is is pretty courageous and pretty against the mainstream uh, um, at the time. Um, and he also understood the threat from the far right. It's interesting, someone who is considered the extreme right in in many ways, and he's in Israeli politics for sure, but he sees as a very clear threat uh, the threat from the far right in the United States as as anti semitism, as the American Nazi Party, neo Nazis, um, and and that's that's something that he a theme that he returned to very often. So he goes on to found what he becomes probably most famous for the JDL, the Jewish Defense League, to combat anti semitism. Um, the he was he was um, it's an organization that continues well beyond. He's he's the active day to day leader only for the first couple of years. He's associated with it till the end of his life, but it keeps on going far beyond that. The guy who succeeded him was a fellow by the name of Irv Rubin, who was even more vocal about violence than Kahana himself was, and he led the JDL for decades. Later, committed suicide in jail. An interesting character. But uh, when Kahana founded it, the mission of the JDL was in the streets of New York, in the Jewish youth, he, to to train them, to, to instill within them uh, Jewish pride. He even started a militia summer camp in upstate New York to train uh, Jewish youth in in you know in karate and in, in, in martial arts, the willing the weapons. Uh, they would patrol the Jewish city neighborhoods. Uh, they would you know how to use uh, guns or even bombs for their objectives, or at least the threat to use uh, for their objectives in protecting Jewish life in New York, which was later used also in his lobbying for Soviet Jewry. Many uh, saw them in, um, sorry, many saw them in comparison, to maybe made comparisons of the JDL to domestic terrorism, such as the Weathermen. Khan himself did not see things that way. He only wanted to use violence for crisis when absolutely necessary, and more often about the to, to use it as a threat, as a deterrent factor. Um, he used to often talk about. Uh, he used to say, "Is Fahana saying had someone assassinated Hitler early on, then the, they would have been considered immoral?" Yet we know today, in hindsight, that he would have saved the world a lot of trouble if he had done that. And the JDL catches national attention not only for its activities, but also for the values that it stood for. Well, almost all mainstream organizations of Jewish life were secular. This was sort of orthodox. It was not the only orthodox organization. It wasn't exactly an orthodox organization either, but it was making waves. Um, and it was hard to place, actually, in the spectrum. Was it orthodox? Was it not orthodox? Was it? Can you classify it altogether? And while most of organizational Jewish life were liberal, this was politically conservative in many areas, though not all. Like I said, he saw the threat was actually on the far right. Um, and it was in this context that he coined never again uh, as a slogan um, and made the symbol of, of, of uh, the JDL modeled on the Black Panthers, which they often compare the JDL to. And he was proud of that comparison. He wanted the Jews to be considered tough also. And often it was agitation and disturbances, not so much real violence. Um, it was against anti the Soviet Union, which I'll get to soon or in part two. And local anti-Semitism. The headquarters of the JDL was in Bar Park, and it was a militant military paraphernalia, a lot of rhetoric. It was to in, in strengthen Jewish identity, Jewish pride, to by fighting anti-Semitism, even in the United States. 
and he understood the the the, 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 the that the that the way to, the means to do it, he understood that before most other organizations understood the potential uh, of that was in the college campus, you know, the Jewish students. He was a powerful orator, which is especially surprising that he overcame a stutter as a young uh, as a young boy, and he overcame that that challenge to be able to become an orator. Again, the human side of the the story as well. Now he, in a certain way, glorified Jewish violence, or at least the ethics of Jewish violence to buy weapons, smuggle weapons, violence used in defense. He was fond of saying that his motto is every Jew a 22. And he was said that he would have used other weapons in that motto, but none of the other ones rhymed, uh, presumably more powerful weapons than a 22, um, which, you know, wouldn't get you very far. So he lived with a very strong sense of the shadow of the Holocaust, and especially what led to the Holocaust. He was fearful of the American future, American Jewish future as far as assimilation, but also in terms of anti-Semitism. He was fearful of it happening again, and things that which led to it might happening again. He was fearful of the trends in American society. Um, and he, the Holocaust was the backdrop of almost everything he did or said. Uh, he used it in every context possible. He grew up in that post-Holocaust generation. There was the a shadow that was hovering over Jewish society at the time. And this is a crucial, as far as I understand, uh, point in the story of Meir Kahana, is the influence that the Holocaust and the potential of something like that happening again, which shaped his entire life and career. The never again was his slogan. And it was later taken on by the Jewish establishment, but they meant something else entirely. What he meant was that never again should there be Jewish passivity to their fate. And what uh, later it became was never again that the Holocaust should never happen again. Um, when the JDL embraced active violence, uh, bombs, you know, the bombing of the Soviet, uh, Soviet something or another, you know, the Soviet culture, bringing in, I forgot the whole story there. There was a new red line for many. Uh, Khan himself was arrested. At the, he was at the periphery the entire time, and now was even more marginalized. Uh, to many people, he had gone too far. He was accused of, uh, or the JDL had gone too far because he himself was not directly involved in that story. He was accused of terrorism and of being a terrorist, but he, um, remained very visible and a force to be reckoned with. And it was at this time in 1970 that Ramesha Feinstein, the Agudas Rabbanim, the Agudas Yisrael, they publicly distanced themselves from the JDL. There's a letter from Ramesha Feinstein in the Jewish press published against association with Kahana and the JDL. Now, the Jewish press was, was where Kahana was a weekly writer, a column editor. That was, that was his place. And, and here he, um, uh, it was written, uh, published a letter from Ramesha. And, and Ramesha knew Meir Kahana. Kahana had written halachic questions to Ramesha when he was a communal uh, rabbi. They were published in Igris Maisha with Meir, Meir Kahana's name. And Ramesha Tendler, Ramesha Feinstein's son-in-law, was the one who eulogized him at his funeral after his assassination. There's uh, the other ones who were, Irving Bunim actually was a fan of uh, Kahana as well. Uh, so there's, it's very complex, it's complicated. Distancing from his actions or actions of the JDL, even if it was not his, but he was known and somewhat well-liked as a person. Uh, Kahana agrees to stay, take a step back. He actually moved to Israel early on, but he commuted so often for the JDL, for speaking engagements, for fundraising, that he was always in America. Uh, and he was always in the United States. He was constantly being arrested and detained there also. Um, and he was speaking everywhere in college campuses. He was, Like I said, he was an orator with a good sense of humor, so he was a popular orator. It was something else that he was involved in at the time was uh, cemetery vandalism. He would send his boys, who came to be known as Kahana's Chayas, like Vilda Chayas, you know, like the, the Chayas squad, like wild animals. That's what they, that they called them, the nickname that they had, and they proudly had, to protect uh, the cemetery from vandalism and Halloween. Later on, there was during the gravedigger strike in New York, he sent them again to dig graves. So all of his, uh, from, of all of his activities over the years, this is the one I personally got a kick out of the most. Because anything that has to do with Jewish graves and cemeteries always uh, piques my interest. So these are all activities during the 60s and 70s. I didn't even get to his activities on behalf of the Soviet jury. That I, that's going to have to wait for part two. And we're going to talk, open up part two with the whole story of his activities on behalf of Soviet jury. And then later, of course, his, uh, his activities in the state of Israel and the Knesset. This is Yehuda Gabriel with Jewish History Soundbites. Part one of Mary Kahana. Part two to come. And you can reach me at Yehuda at YehudaGabriel.com for questions, comments. Sources, tours, trips, sponsorships, and lectures. You can subscribe to Jewish History Soundbites on Podbean or your favorite podcast platform. Follow us on Twitter at Soundbites, and I hope you enjoyed.